That's work. That was the holy term for it. Your other one sucked. I know, that was like, there was, there was passion in that. Yeah. Oh, wow. What? Will you put this in that
ago we used to sing it together and I was just uh, it was crazy because all these songs the last few days have just fallen into place and Jesus has just been really pointing us to these songs and it's just crazy how organic it's been but last night uh, shortly before we went to sleep I was just laying there and I was thinking about peace and it just dropped on my heart I was like man the peace that comes from Jesus is just so great. And I was just meditating on that. And I was like, man, there's just so many people that peace is so foreign to. They don't know what peace is. They've, uh, they've heard of peace, but they've never really experienced it. I know I used to be one of those people. I used to go, yeah, peace, that's a cool like myth, but I don't think it exists, you know? And uh, I have that peace now. 
and, and it says in Romans that we've been made right with God. We have peace with God. And because we've been made right with God, we have peace here on this earth. And, and we will have peace for an eternity to come. And so as we sing for the Lamb, I just want us to really look at the lyrics here as we sing it. Because I know, I know there's people in the room this morning that are struggling with peace and wrestling with peace and going, I want peace and I try to find it in all the wrong things. And, and, and as we sing this, this is, this is the way to peace, guys. And so let's sing this together.
Oh man, so we're about to sing new wine. And I, I was telling Billy, the probably first time I ever told anybody this, but when I first ever heard that song, I thought it was really stupid. <laughs> to be honest, I was like, that song's raw really transparency. <laughs> I heard it, I thought it was I thought it was stupid and girly and lame and, and, and then uh, but I never really listened to what it was saying. I just hummed the tune, I guess, you know. <laughs> so it says uh, I actually I love this song. Only only thanks to Jesus, you know. But it's like every time we get to a group, you know, together and we want to worship, I almost all the time have this song on my heart, uh, more than most. Uh, and, you know, Billy and I were praying in the back, practicing, just worshiping, really. I don't even like to look at it like practice. We're just out worshiping with Jesus and stuff, man. And he uh, put it on, on Billy's heart and stuff to, you know, to pray because of this song about the stuff that's going on in the church and, you know, uh, you know, we're all, you know, our church and stuff, you know, in the houses and with the people, we're being crushed and pressed and things are happening in our lives, man. Uh, and, and one part, particular part of this song uh, sticks, sticks out to me a lot. And it says, when I trust you, it says that I don't need to understand, you know, and, and I don't understand a lot of stuff spiritually and in this world <laughs> you know but I just know one thing though is I know that Jesus saves I know that Jesus loves us I know that Jesus has called us all here for a purpose I know that it's not by uh, coincidence that uh, that dude over there that dude in the blue shirt or like all these people that we aren't familiar with are here uh, it's by Jesus' divine nature uh, that he calls you guys here and called me here you know and and I praise him for that. So as we sing this song, we all know this song. We all love this song, man. Uh, and and, and I, Jesus put on my heart sometimes, man. Like when we're singing this stuff, man, like we're up here. So we're kind of like, I don't want to be the center of attention. You know, we're just here. So everybody's like looking at us, looking at them words. But there's always that cross right there, man. That you guys can project your hearts and stuff to that cross, man. And, and look at it and sing to him and sing to Jesus, man. So as we sing this song, man, let's sing this from our hearts. Let's sing this out. Um, and let's thank Jesus in song, man, for what he's done in our lives. Okay?
you guys join me in prayer. Uh, Jesus, as we entered into your throne room and we sang to you, you know, one of the things we sang that stuck out to me the most was giving you every breath that I'm able to, that it would be yours, every breath that you give us, we would give back to you. I know that we do so much talking, I know I do. And just thinking about what it would be like and what it's going to be like one day when we're with you forever constant worship where every breath has reached perfection where it's all used for you and that's what I want to happen up here this morning Jesus is every breath I have that you've given me 
and the opportunity that you've given me here to speak so that you could speak through me that your spirit Jesus lives in me and you have something that you want to say to us I want every breath to be used for your glory for the honor of your name and to lift you high Jesus I pray against distractions that no matter what happens or what's going on that our hearts will be open and our ears attentive to what it is you're saying. I love you, Jesus, and it's in your name. Amen. Amen. So, as I was heading up here, Will often says to me, break a leg. And, uh, thinking about what Jesus has given me for us today and how that saying in itself is like a cliche. It's a, a saying or an opinion that has been used so much that it lacks the understanding that it was originally said for. And uh, so in First Peter... Chapter 5, verse 7, this is what it says. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. And so those guys who are taking notes, here it is. Are you ready? This stunning revelation today that I have from Jesus. Give it to Jesus. <laughs> I know some of you right now are going, man, you're not even trying anymore, Ken. Last week it was just look at him. And this week it's give it to him. And you're right, I'm not trying. I'm giving it to Jesus. <laughs> and so, give it to Jesus. This has become a thing that has turned into a cliche. This is by no means a cliche, though. It is not an opinion. It is not just a saying, even though it is turned into that, even inside the church world, where, you know, we had a little bit of it go on at a meeting last Tuesday where we discussed this out in Worcester, you know, and as I thought about it Wednesday and was just spending time with Jesus and praying, he just pointed out to me, he's like, no, you don't understand, Ken. Nobody gives it to me. And when they do, it's usually for an hour on Sunday morning or an hour here on this night or an hour here on this day. And they take it right back. And they, they maintain possession of whatever it is. And so this isn't just merely an opinion, but a command from God. This is the Holy Spirit, God, speaking through Peter, going, give it to Jesus. Give it to Jesus. And, and so, you know, as crazy as that sounds to people who don't know Jesus... It, it's sad that it's turned into just a phrase that even Christians use. And the reason that it's become this overused thing that really betrays the original meaning behind it here in Scripture is because so many people are so quick to say that but not do it. It's not supposed to be a saying. It's supposed to be a command of something that we do. And the reason that, and, and I think that we get comfortable giving certain things to Jesus, but not everything, right? There's some things that we just have to handle. There's some things that, hey, you know, and, and even Christians will take scripture and twist it to this, this thing where it's, you know, they say, oh, you gotta, you gotta take matters into your own hands on certain things. And the verse right before it in verse 6 Listen to what it says. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. And so we see this direct tie between pride and not giving it to Jesus. We see this direct tie to not being humble and not giving everything to Jesus. 
There's this pride that creeps up that says, I got to hold on to this thing and take care of it. And really what it comes down to is, you know, when people are struggling with pride, there's usually some insecurity underneath that. That's why we puff ourselves up with pride to cover up our insecurity. And what really starts to happen is we start to view everything and everybody and even God through this self lens. Because what's really happening is we've, we've, we've trusted in ourselves and constantly failed over and over and over and over again. And what you start to do is everybody else that you look at, you're like, well, they're going to fail too. And then you start to look at God and you start to look at him through like this self lens. And you start to see him like us, where he's nothing like us. And you start to think, well, I got, you know, giving it to Jesus just isn't enough. There has to be something else. And that's why there's programs and there's all this other stuff. And even in the, the Christian churches, it's Jesus and you know, give it to Jesus, but usually a but follows that. I know you need to give it to Jesus. And it's sad when that's no longer our advice to people. You know, I felt convicted on Tuesday night when I heard that come out. And, and, and not for them, because it wasn't just them. That's just a small example of everybody who does that. Where they're looking for something else. And shame on us you know, true Christians that believe in Jesus that think that's not enough or that, that we should give some other advice or some other direction for people. I mean, what has it come to when really taking something and putting it in the hands of the creator of the universe is just not enough anymore? And there has to be something else. There has to be something else we need to do. It can't be that simple that we actually just trust Jesus and put it in his hands. And so, like, I, I, I thought about this command, you know, from God and what does it really look like? And, and I started to read through Mark because Mark was Peter's disciple. Mark, what Mark did was. He listened to Peter, and as Peter spoke to him, he wrote down everything Peter told him about his time as he walked closely with Jesus. And in Mark chapter 1, one of the first things we see towards the end of that chapter, talking about giving it to Jesus, is we see a man with leprosy. And what does he do? He runs up to Jesus and kneels in front of him. He's got this disease that separates him from God. And here Jesus is standing there and he comes up and he gives his disease. <clears throat> Let me say it again. He gives his disease to Jesus. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about because you've been diagnosed with an incurable disease of addiction. And there has to be something else you got to do. You can't just give it to Jesus. All right? What's the one who speaks and gives life going to do? Whatever he wants. <laughs> and, so, and so this guy with this disease that separates him, and he runs up and he kneels down, and what does he say? He goes, Jesus, if you're willing. And what I love is that Jesus reaches out and goes, I'm willing. This is the picture of the cross. Where Jesus comes to us and reaches out with both arms and goes, I'm willing. I'm willing. But are you? Here I am, arms wide open. I'm willing, Jesus is saying. And so we see, you know, the guy with leprosy comes up and, and Jesus reaches out and touches him and goes, you're not separated from God anymore. Because you have faith. Because you brought it and you gave it to Jesus. In chapter 2, we see some, uh, some guys carrying a friend, and they dig a hole in the roof, and they lower their friend down to Jesus' feet. 
And Jesus, seeing their faith, goes, your sins are forgiven. And so we see what? What all should you take to Jesus? What all should you give to Jesus? Well, you should give them people, broken people. <laughs> what else are you going to do with them? Where are you going to refer them to? Where are you going to take them? Jesus goes, bring broken people to me. Well, we should give them to Jesus. In uh, Mark chapter 3, Jesus is teaching in a synagogue. And there's a guy with a deformed hand. And Jesus calls him down in front of everybody. And what's he say? Reach out your hand. <laughs> he says, hey, give your deformity to me. Give that thing that you're ashamed, to, ashamed of to me. That thing that you're trying to hide, Jesus goes, give it to me. Reach it out and give it to me. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus gets on a boat with his disciples and he takes a nap. There's a storm that hits. His disciples are afraid. They come running to who? Jesus. And wake him up. And Jesus stands up and he gives peace, be still, and everything calms. Jesus is saying, give your fears and your anxieties to me. Give it to me. Mark chapter 5. They get off the boat. There's a guy who's demon possessed. He's been cutting himself, running around in the tombs, running around all night, howling in the streets. And what's he do? He sees Jesus. He says, Nobody could restrain him. Everybody tried to restrain him. Everybody tried to, to control his behavior. Everybody tried to do everything they could except what? Bring him to Jesus. And, and, and he gets off the boat, and the guy comes running out and falls on his knees at Jesus' feet. And Jesus is saying, Bring your mental illness to me, bring your addiction to me. Mark chapter 6. There's 5,000 people that are hungry. And they go, what are we going to do? And Jesus goes, what do you got? Go see how much bread, go see how much food you got. And do what? Bring it to me. And so they take what they have and they put it in Jesus' hands. And Jesus models exactly what it looks like to trust God with it and to take it to God. He holds it up and goes, I'm giving it to God. And it's enough. And suddenly what was never going to be enough in the hands of Jesus is more than enough. Mark chapter 7. There's a deaf man. There's a deaf man and he can't speak either. He can't speak right. And it's because he can't hear. And sometimes there's something that's wrong that's affecting other things in your life and that's why those are messed up. And Jesus gets right to the heart of the issue. And guess what's happening? He walks up and there's a bunch of people and they're taking him to Jesus. See, word has started to spread as he sent the guy from the tombs out and as Jesus is just coming along. And what people are starting to realize is like, man, every time we take something to Jesus, he does something amazing. And so word is starting to spread and Jesus, you know, shows up here and there's a bunch of people and they got this guy who's deaf and he can't speak right. They're like begging Jesus. They're going, Jesus, do something. See, people have started to just give it to Jesus. And so he takes them, you know, over to the side and, you know, spits on his fingers, puts it in his ears, touches his mouth. But he, he gives this sigh as he looks up and gives it to God and goes, <sighs> and he says, Ephatha which means be open. And it just goes on and on. I mean, after this happens in, you know, Mark chapter 8, he heals a blind man. 
And he touches them, and same thing's happening again. All these people are bringing the blind man to Jesus, and they're like, Jesus, we're just bringing him to you. We don't know what else to do. We know that he needs you. And Jesus heals his sight, but it's not all the way perfect. And Jesus touches him again. And Jesus says, continue to give it to me. Don't just give it to me and then run off on your own, doing your own thing, but stay close to me. Constantly give it to Jesus. I mean, it goes on and on. What I want to stop and talk about for a second is in Mark chapter 7, where Jesus sighs and says, be opened. Because he hears the cliche of giving it to Jesus, and this is where it comes from, because the world goes, what? That's so close-minded. That's what you got? You're going to give it to Jesus? What about this program? What about this pill? What about this injection? What about covenant eyes? There's so many tools that you can use in your toolbox. And somehow that stuff is better than giving it to Jesus, the creator of the universe. Just think about that, guys. Because I guarantee everybody sitting here right now is already, it's, the Holy Spirit's already started to karate chop you. Right? That's what I like to think of it as. To think of it as like the Holy Spirit's just like, you know, I know like you want it to be this gentle whisper on your heart. <laughs> I really think it's more like the karate chop. That's how it feels to me all the time. He's already started to karate chop you and be like, see, you don't give it to me. You don't take it to me. But he goes, hey, you know, they go, you guys, you guys just, you know, you're so close-minded over there. Talking about just give it to Jesus and see, this is the problem and this is what's going on in 2 Timothy in chapters 3 and 4 where, you know, Paul is talking about the dangers of the last days. And how there's going to be teachers that oppose the truth and love pleasure rather than God. And, you know, he goes on to, to really hit home about God's word. He goes on to really hit home about this and how important this is. And how important it is to not try and take this and twist it and mangle it to fit it into your life and into your comfort somehow. So you could walk around and go, I know Jesus, but uh, how you need to break your life. How you need to let Jesus break you and then put you in here. That's why it's always been my prayer, guys, that we would be in this church, people that walked out of this book. And people would look over here and they'd go, ah, the only time I see that is when I read this. They would look at the people here and go, I don't see that going on anywhere but in here. I we would be people that walk straight out of this book. And he's telling them, he's going, hey, you've been taught the scriptures. And he goes, and you know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose is in life. And he goes, and I've suffered for it. I've suffered persecution for it. Sure, you might have some people come along and say some things about you and tell you, you know, you're not open-minded. Is that still working on you? And Paul was willing to get beat, even physically, to stay true to this word. And so he tells them, what is he saying? He's going, hey, I'm telling you, I'm solemnly urging you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. This is a big statement. I'm urging you in front of Christ Jesus, who's going to come and set up his kingdom, and he's going to judge. Listen, this is what I'm urging you to do on the tail end of that. Preach the word. Stay true to Jesus. Give it to Jesus. And he tells them, 
Because the time's coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. See, it says, listen to sound and wholesome teaching. Or you can go anywhere and find a program that has some teaching from here. But not wholesome teaching. Not the whole thing. And he goes, they'll want to follow their own desires. That when you only listen to some teaching, it leaves it open for you to follow your own desires. And to follow your own feelings. And he goes, they'll reject the truth and chase after myths. Bouncing from place to place to hear what they want to hear. Bouncing from place to place to get more tools for their toolbox so somehow they can hold on to their earthly life and not have to give it all up to follow Jesus. Somehow they found some loophole in here where it's not going to cost you your life. You don't really have to pick up a cross. You just look at it every now and then and be good. You just hang one around your neck. And go, I'm in. They'll chase after myths. They'll chase after programs and they'll chase after behavior management and they'll chase after pills and they're chasing after injections, all the while calling it open-mindedness. The whole time claiming that you're the one who's closed-minded and they're the ones that's open-minded. The very next thing that he says, but you should keep a clear mind in every situation. And don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry, guys. He said, listen, no, no, no. Stay in here so you'll have a clear and open mind and work at giving it to Jesus. And taking other people and giving them to Jesus. He goes, work at telling people the good news. Work at sharing the gospel and constantly taking people to Jesus. You know, it's funny because in that Peter verse, it says, give all your worries and cares. All of them. In the completeness. And, you know, at the end of Luke, I think it's 24. I don't know, I could be wrong. I think it's 24. It's at the end, though. It's after the resurrection. And Jesus is talking to his disciples. And it says, he opened up their minds to understand the scriptures. He goes, no, actually, actually getting in here and reading this and having the Holy Spirit do something and illuminate scripture to you, he goes, that's how you get an open mind. He goes, if you haven't experienced that and you don't know what Jesus is saying here, he goes, no, you've got a closed mind. If you're, if you're taking things to something else or to some other program or to someone else other than Jesus, he's like, those are the ones that are closed minded. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where Paul says, when I came to you guys, I forgot about everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. He goes, I forgot about everything else. He goes, I didn't want to tell you guys about anything else. I didn't want to take you to anyone else. I didn't want to, you know, take your problems and what you were going through to anyone else. He goes, I came and all I wanted to do, I forgot about everything else except Jesus. And it says, no eye has seen and no ear has heard and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. You see, it's talking about being closed-minded. It's going, no eye has seen and no ear has heard and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. He goes, closed-minded. Your mind can't even imagine. And then the very next thing it says, but it was to us that God revealed these things 
by his spirit. For his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. Are you telling me that there's some way to be more open-minded than God sharing his deep secrets through his spirit? Are you kidding me? That's what it said. It goes, no, 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 listen. You're closed-minded until the Holy Spirit opens you up and opens up your mind. And then you know God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit. It doesn't get any more open-minded than this. So we can know the wonderful things that God has freely given us. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it. So they look at someone who has the Spirit of God living in them, who has just opened their mind to know God's deep secrets and His mystery that was revealed at the cross and through the resurrection and through putting His Spirit in them, and they go, Man, you guys are so close-minded. You need a couple of these tools for your toolbox. So crazy. That's so crazy. And it's the other way around. It's completely the other way around. Jesus is like, this is God sitting on his throne up there right now with millions of angels surrounding him, worshiping him. And he goes and puts his spirit in us. And it says, but we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. It's the exact definition of open-minded. We have the mind of God. And I know, because I talk to you guys before I come up here and I just inside I was just smiling you know because almost everybody I talked to is just like I knew I'm going to go oh, that's right I got to give it to Jesus <laughs> like really give it to Jesus like really trust him <clears throat> like so the guys in uh in John chapter 6, you know, Jesus feeds 5,000 people and then, you know, does that little thing where he walks on water. No big deal. And then they come and find him. And that's what they say to him in verse 28. They reply, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? And listen, we want, to, we want to perform God's works. What should we do? And Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. You see what he's saying? He goes, you should give it to Jesus. He goes, if you really believe, then you trust. That's, those things go together. Those are like the same word. If you really believe in Jesus, you really believe he's the creator of the universe, man, that he, he gives life, that he takes it away, that he died so that you could come close to him. And then he rose from, I mean, he rose from the dead three days later. Like he laid dead for three days and then came back to life. I don't know why we'd give him anything. I, I, it's much better in my hands. I'm sure. I'm sure I'm going to be able to figure something out. Don't give it to the one who defeated death. I mean, that's just so close minded. That doesn't make any sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. Who else's hands do you want that in? Anything, whatever it is, or somebody. You know, in in Mark chapter 9, it continues to happen. And, uh, you know, he comes down from the transfiguration, and there's a bunch of people fighting down there. And and somebody has brought their son, who's got a demon. And the disciples, you know, are being stupid and fighting among each other and can't cast out this demon. And Jesus says, bring the boy to me. Well, somebody goes... 
bring the boy to me. And he casts it out and, you know, complete peace, the boy completely healed. But I always think about that dad. Because he, he took what he cared about most on this earth, so he believed in Jesus. Because he took what he cared about most on this earth, and he gave it to Jesus. He was like, here, I... There's a woman in there in Mark that's bleeding for 12 years or something like that. And, you know, and, and all the doctors and everything she went to and everything, it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And then you know exactly what that's like. No matter what you tried to do, it's gotten worse and worse and worse. No matter who you've trusted other than Jesus, it's gotten worse and worse and worse. And yet she comes and finally just reaches out and touches Jesus. And, and she's completely healed. She brought what she couldn't fix, what continued to get worse, and she gave it to Jesus. And that's what Jesus says here. He goes, oh, you guys want to do God's works? Well, give it to me. Believe in the one that he sent. Actually trust me. Actually trust me and, and give it to me. That is the description of my whole life since I've met Jesus. Like, it can be summed up like this. I prayed, and then Jesus did this thing. Everything. I can't take credit for one thing that Jesus has done that really recovered since I've met Jesus. Not one thing. None of the houses y'all stay in, none of the houses that are coming, none of it. I can't take credit for any of it. There was no, you know, we didn't wait to have provision before we did anything. We just went, Jesus will do something. Like that should that should that should describe your relationship with Jesus. I prayed, and this is what Jesus did. I prayed, and this is what Jesus did. I gave it to Jesus, and look at what Jesus did. That that should be the banner of your relationship with Jesus. It, it's funny because I meet pastors and stuff all the time and they've heard things or whatever. You know, I don't know where I get this reputation, but we, we get together and we start to talk and it almost always ends the same way. They always go, wow. They go, it's really awesome what Jesus is doing. And I love how you don't take any credit for it. I'm like, I can't. I love how you just give all the credit to Jesus. I'm like, did you hear the stories? Like, I don't I didn't do anything. I gave it to Jesus. That's all I did. I just gave it to him and he did something. And I just trust him. Like, really trust him. I really believe in him. That he is on the throne in complete power with all authority in heaven and on earth. And, and I know he's bending down with his hand like this. You know how I know that? Because of the cross. Because of the empty tomb. Because he lives in me. So I just, you know... I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who gave his life for me. Give it to Jesus. That's it. It's the big, mind-blowing sermon of the dead. Give it to Jesus. And now we get the opportunity to do that right now. And that's why we pray at the end. So we can actually respond to what Jesus is saying to us. There's a time right now where you have an opportunity to really like pray and give it to Jesus. And not take it back when you walk out the door. Some of you guys that are carrying heavy burdens from stuff that you've done and screwed up and whatever else. Because you weren't giving it to him says, if we confess our sins to him, then he's faithful and just to not just forgive us, but to cleanse us from all wickedness. That we can just walk out of here clean. But only if you give it to Jesus. Only if you give it to him. I, I just... I. 
I hope we never lose that uh, as, as we expand and as Jesus continues. Just that should always be the most valid advice ever. And it needs to be modeled in your life. And that's probably some of the problem and why it turned into some cliche in the Christian world because people love to say it, but then you look at their life and they don't do it. And, and what I love with what Jesus has done with a group like us, you know, is, is that he gives us this opportunity. Like I was talking the other day about uh, with somebody about like when I first met Jesus, I didn't even want to be called a Christian. I was like, I, I don't want to be called that. I just want to, I'm going to just say, I follow Jesus. I was like, I don't, you know, because I just felt like it just had this bad, just ugh about it. It's just the stuff I had seen and heard and everybody that I had known at that time was just like, I don't, I don't want to be lumped in with a Christian. I just want to follow you, Jesus. That's terrifying. I didn't even know. I'm not even church, so that's coming from the mouth of just a, a you know, a baby who was just like, ah. and 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 in my time, as I started to read this and I read through Acts and I saw where they were first called Christians, and you know, in my time with Jesus, He just said, I want to use people like you can and like the people that I'm having you go to to take it back to here. So what being Christians is really about that we would be people that walked out of this book that we would be people that give it to Jesus and we actually do that and I told you guys from the start when I started I didn't have people come to me with all kinds of stuff and I'm like I don't know what to do with that but I know somebody who does that was that was People come from other states and sit down and give me fancy uh, lunches and want to pick my brain on how we're doing what we're doing because they want to do it somewhere. And, and we want to start up something like we're recovered. How are you doing? You got the pen and the paper and like give it to Jesus. I, I, like I, I'm not even being mean. I don't even know what to say ever. You know, and I've already eaten half the food, so I'm like, I, you're gonna have to pay for it either way. I'm like. I, and so I'm just like, I don't, I don't have, give it to Jesus. Like, I'm like, you believe in Jesus, right? Like, I, I, I like, so I'm so stupid. I'm not even trying to be mean. I swear to you, I'm like, I don't understand what we're talking about. Like, we just trusted Jesus. And he built his church. He, like, he says it in here that he's going to build his church, that he's going to do this. And I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. We could have went somewhere cheaper. I'm like, I don't know. You know, like, I that I like. <laughs> just slide your Bible over. All awkward, you know. Like, should read that. Like I just, <laughs> we just be people that give it to Jesus. I mean, come on, man. That's what it is. And then really trust that hey, he's going to do something. And it's not about my time or any of that stuff. And whatever he does is best and, and good and right. And here, Jesus is here. Give it to Jesus. I love you guys, man. Give it to Jesus. Give it to Jesus. We don't preach that enough. You know? And I feel like that's what Jesus is telling me today. He's like, you're just going to go out there and show how everybody who gives something to me, I take care of. I take care of my business. I'm God. Right? He's like, I'm God. People need to give it to me. Stop playing God and give it to me. So we're gonna, we got some baptism. You want to do baptism? We got some people who are going, I'm going to give it to Jesus. Yeah. Don't, for, hey, don't forget afterwards, we want some guys to gather around, lay hands on, and, and pray that they're filled with the Holy Spirit, but also... Don't forget after the baptism to sit at your table and pray and give it to Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 One of you guys want to hop in your cooking at
What you're going to want to do, both of you guys, is you're going to want to sit on your bums and move as far forward as you can because we don't want you to bonk your head or anything like that. Hey. <laughs> and that's that's exactly what I was thinking. As, as I knew we were going to have a couple baptisms, I go... That, that's exactly all of our stories who have come to Christ, right? Is we came to that beautiful place, right? That beautiful place where we're at the end of our rope, you know? And as you were talking, Ken, I was thinking, man, like, people, we, we spent so much energy avoiding that place, you know? Avoiding that place of, I have nothing else. I'm going to give it to you, Lord, you know, and, and, and we're just like, avoid that, we're going to figure something out, we're going to, we got a next move, you know, and, and as we were going through the message, I was just like, you know, like, how freeing that is for us that we don't have to figure it out, that we're just like, here, Lord, and we know, we know, like, we know he's going to do what he says he's going to do, you know, and it's just like, wow, like, what more could you want? And so I'm grateful that we're celebrating a couple baptism, baptisms that these guys came to that place where they're like, I, I don't I don't got a next move in me. I don't got um, a, a plan. I, I'm not going to give it to uh, this place and this place and this place or that person, you know, I'm going to give it to the Lord and uh, we got both Johnnies up here they're both Johnny, but Johnny Kenny first, man that's where he came, you know, he came to that place where he was just like I, I ain't got nothing left in the tank and what I noticed about him when he first came in the house and I didn't do too much talking to him at first, Josh Lego does a lot of the intakes for the house now and uh, but when he came, I started to talk to him. I got to be a part of him uh, surrendering his life to the Lord, which was cool. I got to witness that. And uh, But what I noticed about him when he first came in was he was on this pursuit of finding a place. And when he came, he just kept saying, man, I'm so grateful uh, that I'm here. And I kept hearing from his mouth, uh, like, hey, I'm not trying to do something to kind of you know, waste time or I'm just going to kind of do another whatever 90 day, six month program and uh, kind of go about my life. He goes this, and I remember word for word, he said, this is kind of like a, like a life thing. You know, he goes like a forever thing. I want something new. And I just kept telling him, you have come to the right place. And uh, man, Johnny has new life today because he was done, you know, and, and, and so what we did is exactly what Ken has taught us to do. We opened up the Bible. <laughs> and we're like, okay, let's read this. Let's read Romans chapter 1. Let's see how we've turned away from the Lord. You know, let's uh, review the last uh, 30 plus years of your life. And, and l have, you, have you figured it out? No, you know, that's why you're here. Look, what the Bible is saying is true. We've all turned away. The effects of sin is death and no peace and misery and destruction, you know. And, and, and you just sit there and you go, wait, that is true. Like my life confirms that that is true. That's exactly what Johnny was experiencing and nothing less. You know, but the good news is, is that Christ died for him. The good news is that Christ was raised to life uh, for him. And Johnny has put his faith in Christ. And Jesus did do what he says he's going to do. He raised him from the dead, and we get to celebrate that today. So we praise Jesus for you, Johnny. Uh, Johnny, I just want to ask you a few questions, man. Do you believe that Christ uh, is God, do you believe that he died on the cross for your sins? Do you believe that he was raised to life? And do you declare him Lord of your life? Absolutely. All right, Johnny, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Stand over here, Johnny. We'll pray over you at the end, man. Uh, this is other Johnny, man. Uh, John Jones. 
It's not as cold usually as it, us as it usually is at summertime. Uh, but man, this is this is uh, John Jones here, and uh, man, it, it's it's what what what's what's so cool about Johnny here is to see how he is today versus when he first came in the house, and he's only been in the house. It, it hasn't even been two weeks yet. I think it's been maybe like a week and a half. Uh, maybe we're coming up on two weeks, but my point is, is it hasn't been a long time, and to see what Christ has done with him just in. Uh, the last two weeks has been so beautiful. When he first came in, he was just filled with darkness. You know, he had spent, uh, you know, close to a week uh, not sleeping before he came in. And uh, he was just full of darkness. You could tell he was full of darkness. And so we loved on him, you know, but this darkness just had a hold of him. Um, and what's an awesome part of his story, which people would go that that's really not an awesome thing but to me it's awesome because Jesus has used it for good as he was filled with darkness the other night and he cut his throat with a steak knife and went to the hospital you know that his blood was uh, or his bed was uh, filled with blood and it was like whoa you know like that's not cool don't do that that is not what people do you know but uh, we knew that it was just the darkness in Johnny. And, and when he came back, he was a little more clear, you know, and, and just totally, totally receiving of the gospel. Like you could just see new life in him. And what was so cool for me is I would have these conversations with him and I, I just seen the cut on his neck. I would just look at the cut on his neck, you know, and I'd see him smiling and I'd see him full of life, you know, and. And it was just cool. Like, I, it, to me, that's awesome because it's like, hey, that, that's, that's a reminder of, of what, what Christ ha has done with you, where he's brought you from. I had a moment the other night, and, and I guarantee the guys didn't even see what I was seeing. But um, me and Lego went to the house early in the day, and you could just tell there was um, some darkness lingering there, and there was just an atmosphere of, like, eeriness. And uh, through the day, we prayed. Through the day, we loved. Through the day, we uh, opened the Word of God and dug into that. And you could see through the day, the atmosphere just changing. And uh, by the end of the day, uh, the house was just so full of love. And so people were just in a good mood and so full of life. And I kept seeing Johnny. He stuck out to me because I, I would just see him, like, clinging to every word we said and, and, and um, you know, he, he would be observant of what we were even talking about with other people, and he'd be clinging to those truths, and, and I was seeing, I was just seeing him smile and seeing him full of life, and, and we swung by the other day, and I, I just seen him, and uh, it, it was Pat as well, and, and they weren't doing nothing too special, but they were just, you know, they were being family, they were joking around, we're down in the... Um, in the common area and I had this moment where I was just like man that's why we do what we do you know like don't ever forget that guys why we do what we do why we come here why this even exists you know and, and I'm looking at a guy who literally just cut his throat with a steak knife rejoicing with his brother singing praises to the Lord full of life full of joy and that's why we do what we do, guys. There's, there's nothing better than that. What are you going to do besides that that is fulfilling? What are you going to do besides that that has any sort of purpose? I, I've tried. It, it's it's it, nothing compares. And, 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 and this isn't just uh, for this life. Of course, I get the joy of seeing Johnny uh, rejoice at the house and, and live an awesome uh, fulfilling life down here, but the most awesome part about it is 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 I'll see him there, and, and and that'll be for eternity, and that's why we do what we do, guys. So we we praise God for you, Johnny. Do you declare Christ Lord of your life? Do you believe that He died for your sin? Do you believe that He was raised to life? Absolutely. All right, Johnny. We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs>
turn on television and turn on these guys as well. Dude, I'm, I'm just like, oh my God.